Hi everybody and welcome to vodcast number three. I'm Mr. Galladay and this is Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School. Uh, as always as I'm going through this presentation if you have any questions you should just jot those down on the left side of your notes and I'm going to start off with a little uh, kind of a picture show here to just give you some idea of different types of living things um, most of the time when we talk about living things you might think of your dog or cat or things that are familiar to us um, and we're going to start off by looking at some pictures of, of things that are alive um, and thinking about what are some things that uh, make us living or, or what are the things that, that constitute um, make a, a living thing. Um, first of all when you look at these first set of pictures I want you to think about why is it easy to tell that all of these things are, are alive. Okay, so when you look at the, the pictures of the gorilla, the squirrels, the, the cows, the dog, the jaguars, the uh, whatever that thing is up in the top right, a dingo, I guess, um, you know, they're pretty easy to identify as living things, even though in these pictures, obviously, they're not moving. We see some examples of some behaviors that we're familiar with, uh, playing, uh, eating, uh, a mother taking care of its child, so forth. Um, and all of these things have a face, right? They all have an eyes, nose, mouth, uh, things that are, are recognizable, um, that, that we recognize as, as being living things. Um, and that's even true when we get into um, animals that aren't very much like us. So when we look at fish or birds or reptiles, that um, they still have a mouth, they still have eyes, um, they still have a recognizable face and so they still have some characteristics um, that we recognize. Um, that starts to change then when we get into other types of things that we might also recognize as, as living when we start looking at insects or spiders or uh, some of these kind of creepy crawly things. Um, we because they move right uh, and, and even then we still we they have some characteristics that we know are um, make them living. Um, that really starts to get complicated when we start looking at some of the things that live in the ocean, uh, things like barnacles or sponges or uh, corals, things of that nature. Uh, when we start looking at those, we see that um, now these are some things that really don't have any kind of a face or any anything that's really recognizable, even though everything uh, that you're looking at here is actually an animal. Um, they really don't have the types of things that we associate with uh, with being an animal. And when that begins to get even more complicated is when we consider things like plants and fungi and uh, molds and, and things like that that um, uh, again that we might recognize as being alive um, but now are really really different from us. Um, and as we'll see uh, as we go further in the course we'll see that they really are very, very different uh, from us. And this gets probably to the extreme situation when we start looking at uh, microscopic living things, right? These are all examples of single-celled living organisms. So from the bacteria up to maybe some of the larger things uh, that you see in a, in a sample of pond water, um, these are all examples of living things that are made up of a single cell. And again, you know, no sign of a face here, um, but they are very definitely living things. So this brings up the question of, well, what are these things? What can they possibly have? Uh, what kind of characteristics do they have in common with us? Uh, okay, as we get started here, um, be sure to fill out your table of contents. This is the last time that I'm going to show a, um, a screen like this, so by now you should be getting familiar with uh, keeping your table of contents. Um, and how that works. Uh, by now I know that some of you, uh, you know, if you write a little bit bigger, uh, you may be on a page farther ahead than four. Uh, if you write really small, you, well, even then you should still be on page four, but um, most of you, um, you know, or many of you will be, your, your table of contents are going to begin to look a little bit different, okay? So, uh, by now, I think you all know how to do this. So, this, like I said, this will be the last time that, um, that I'll be showing you this screen. 
Um, before I get into the characteristics, I first want to talk a little bit about what we call the levels of organization of living things. Um, and I'll explain what that means here. Um, if we look at the very smallest thing that, that make up uh, living things, we're looking at basically molecules. And in this case, um, we have uh, molecules. Uh, and this is a water molecule um, that's, of course, made up of uh, oxygen and hydrogen atoms. Um, and then the molecules go together to make up uh, more sophisticated things that we call organelles. Now, at this point, these two things are not living. Of course, molecules are not living and organelles are not living. But when we get to the next level up, um, organelles are what go together to make up cells. Now, cells are important because these are uh, the simplest things that have all the characteristics of life. Okay, and we'll be talking about those characteristics shortly. But they have all the characteristics um, of living things uh, that you or I or any other living thing does. Um, they, they are the smallest unit, which is to say that they are the smallest uh, functional unit uh, that has all those characteristics of life. When we go above the cell, when we organize cells, we organize them into something called tissues. Now, I'm not talking about Kleenex here. I'm talking about groups of cells, all of the same type that do a similar function. So in this case, when we put a bunch of bone cells together, we have bone tissue. Um, you may be familiar with muscle tissue or uh, skin tissue. These are all types of, um, of tissue that are all composed of single types of cell. Uh, when we organize, uh, tissues together into a functional group, we have an organ. And in this example, we have a leg bone, um, which is a, a, called a femur, uh, and that's a particular organ, which is composed of tissue. Um, organs go together to make up what we call organ systems. In this case, the organ system that we're looking at is the skeletal system. When you put all the organ systems together, you arrive at what we call the organism level of organization. Um, this is the one that is probably most familiar to us. We're familiar with looking at different types of organisms. And, and when we think about living things, we tend to think of them at the organism level. Although much in biology, we're going to spend a lot of time going back and forth between these levels. Um, we'll be spending a lot of time this semester talking about cells, organelles, molecules, um, and we'll begin to move back and forth between the organism level and the cell level. So we'll be talking about organs, organ systems, and how those all go together. Now, when we go above the organism level, things begin to get a little more unfamiliar to us. We're used to sort of breaking things down, but uh, we're not used to thinking of ourselves as part of a larger group, but of course we are. We are all members of population, um, and we are, of course, all members of our species. Uh, one of the things that we'll be seeing, particularly next semester, is that the population and species level is probably just as important, maybe even more important, than the organism level. We're just not used to thinking um, on that level of organization. Okay? Um, when we put all of the, or, uh, the populations in a particular place, uh, and we look at all the living things, we call that a community. So in this case, we're talking about not only the wolves, but also the grass, the things that they eat, the bacteria in the soil, uh, the plants, and so forth that live in the particular place that they do. When we move above the community level, now we're talking about an ecosystem. This includes um, all of the non-living aspects of the environment, the climate, the, the types of minerals in the soil, how often it rains, um, what form the, the precipitation falls in. Is it fall in rain or snow or fog or whatever? And then um, when we combine all the ecosystems on the planet, we get into what's called the biosphere, which is the uh, part of the earth which is um, inhabitable by living things. Okay, these um, levels of organization, uh, very important uh, list of things to know. Um, you should be able to know the things smaller than an organism. So when we talk about organ systems, we're talking just below the organism level. When we talk about organs, we're talking about things that are, are parts of an organ system. Uh, tissues are made of cells. Uh, cells are made of organelles and so forth. So 
be, you want to be sure that you are familiar with these levels of organization. Okay, now we're going to get into some characteristics of all living things, and I'm just going to give you the list here. Uh, this is something that we're going to be doing a lab on and getting familiar with um, in, in class with a, a couple different activities. Uh, the first characteristic is that all living things that we know of that have ever been described or ever been looked at are made of cells. Um, now this does not include viruses. Viruses in biological sense are not alive, even though we do talk about um, sometimes killing a virus. Well, you may hear that term, um, but it, um, in a strict biological sense, viruses are not living things, and we'll see uh, some examples, and as we get more into the course, we'll see why, uh, some other reasons why that is. Uh, also, all living things can reproduce. So this is a characteristic of all life, all living things. Um, they're made of cells and they're able to reproduce. Another thing that we know about all living things is that there's a universal genetic code. Um, uh, again, we'll just talk a little bit more this, this year, well, actually quite a lot more this semester about what a, a universal genetic code is, what that exactly means, um, but that is a, a characteristic of all living things that, uh, that we know of. Um, in addition, we know that all living things are able to grow and develop. They go through uh, distinct stages of growth, whether you're a bacteria, um, a oak tree, or a person, or um, a, a mouse, you go through um, distinct stages of growth and development uh, throughout your lifetime. All living things uh, somehow obtain materials and use energy. Um, this is a characteristic of all living things from, from the cell level all the way up to, um, you know, whales and us and uh, oak trees. Um, living things all uh, are able to respond to their environment. This is a very important characteristic that we'll be um, looking at in some detail. Um, they maintain some kind of a, they respond to their internal environment in order to maintain a uh, relatively stable internal environment. And this is called homeostasis. Um, very important term and again uh, it, going forward, we'll look at lots and lots of examples of this throughout the year. This is a real important concept in biology. And then the last thing uh, to be aware of is that when we talk about populations of living things, um, those populations do change over time. Um, and then we'll see lots and lots of examples of that. We'll do some labs in class where we'll be able to observe that happening. Okay, so these are the characteristics that all living things share. And one of the things uh, to start with, what I'd like for you to do is um, consider a couple examples um, and then basically write down which of the characteristics of living things they have and which they don't have. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples here, and this is to do. Um, again, on that output side, on that left side, um, consider if these things are alive. Um, why or why not? Remember that list that I just showed you, um, to be considered a living thing, um, they need to have all of these characteristics. Okay, um, So if something has most of these characteristics, um, then it's not really considered to be alive. And we'll kind of uh, talk about this in some detail in class, but um, I do want you to consider these examples right now. Um, think about fire, cars, computers, clouds, copy machines. Um, are these things that are alive? If so, why? If not, why not? All of these things you'll see have some characteristics of life, but they may not necessarily have all of them. Okay, I'm going to leave you with uh, a little bit of a humorous note. Uh, this is uh, a picture that my mom sent me a, a while back uh, in an email. Uh, I know many of you have brothers and sisters, some of whom I've had in class, and this is um, a little picture that uh, you, you might be able to relate to if your mom likes you best. Uh, you know, so I hope that you all are getting lots of nice, juicy insects 
uh, and that your mom isn't standing on your head to feed your little brother. So on that note, I'm going to sign off. This is Mr. Galladay. This has been podcast number three for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School. I hope you have a great day.